before we talk about time management, um, did y'all get my email about the senior opera night is back? Yes? Well, maybe the juniors didn't get it. The seniors got it. Seniors got it. Yeah, right. So um, how many of you have ever been to an opera? One. That's about right. That's, that's about the right amount. Um, uh, and how many seniors do we have? Okay, good. So um, it's really an experience. You know, and I'm going to encourage you to come. I mean, people have different things going on, and it is an evening thing, but um, I'll send out more information. But, uh, you know, the music center, and you get to dress up, and and uh, it, the only people in this particular performance are students and VIPs, like big donors and things like that. So it's kind of it's kind of an interesting experience for that. And the, uh, the opera itself, uh, this particular opera, I've never seen it, but I know it has to do with um, – like forced marriage and murder and people going mad and using drugs. So it should be really pretty interesting. And it's from like, I know what, like 1700s Donizetti Italian opera. It should be really great. And they have, they have English subtitles, so you don't have to worry about that. So think about it, and uh, I'll get you more information coming up. But let's start with time management. All right, so time management. Two words, time and management. And time, time is a funny concept because, I mean, you know, I've done, I've done a little bit of study of it, um, you know, like from the physics and scientific standpoint. And, it, you know, it's really right. Anybody ever heard Stephen Hawking's A Short History of Time? You know, I tried to read that book. I, maybe I got 10% of it, you know. It's so convoluted. And it's like things like, um, you know, when, when, they, when they shoot somebody up into space, that, that their time is moving more slowly? You, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, explain that to me, please. I, I mean, I, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. But, but for our purpose, uh, time is pretty straightforward. And, and time is events happening one after another. And management refers to control. So what we're trying to do with time management is the act of controlling events. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to control as much of what we, as much of what goes on around us as we can. So, three key areas to time management: congruity, concentration of power, and the relationship between urgent and vital. So we're going to go over each of those uh, um, one at a time. And like the way I got interested in this was. Um, uh, when I, I was in business, uh, so when I started in business in 1985, um, I used to have to drive a lot, and um, I would listen to, at the time, they were like audio cassette tapes. You've all seen a cassette tape, right? Yes, yeah, so what that is, right? So that was, so that was the mode of, uh, of uh, audio. And, um, and I was heading out for a meeting, and, uh, and I asked a buddy of mine, I said, you got any good tape to listen to? And he gave me this, like, a 12-tape package on time management. And, um, man, it, it, it changed my life. I mean, really, in all seriousness, I would not be here teaching today if I hadn't that. Yeah, I, I just wouldn't. I mean, I, my life would have been completely different. I was, like, disorganized. My desk was, like, piled with papers. And, you know, it was, uh, I don't know, I don't know where I would be, you know. So, but it's really had a big effect on me. And, uh, and I've studied it, gone to a lot of lectures, and, and um, you know, I'm, pretty good at it. So, congruity, concentration of power, relationship between urgent and vital. So, what congruity is talking about is having balance in your life. How many people have a parent who is a workaholic? It's amazing, you know, really, how many of the, uh, you know, and um, that's not good, you know, that, that, that's, that, that can be very unhealthy. And the, the classic example um, is uh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh, everybody's heard of Vincent Van Gogh, right? You know, and, and you know, the guy was like 100% focused on his painting. That was it. I mean, he didn't, I mean, he had to, his brother had to make sure he ate. His brother had to bring him his paints, you know, and, and I mean, and, and the guy, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is necessarily why he went crazy. He did. I mean, the guy was crazy, you know, cuts off his ear and, you know, and dies an early death. And then we, I compare that to like uh, Pablo Picasso, who <clears throat> uh, 
um, had a very balanced life, you know, interested in literature, interested in politics, uh, probably had too many women, but um, he was really, uh, he had a very balanced life and um, lived a really long time and produced a tremendous volume of artwork. Whereas Van Gogh's very small volume of artwork. It's all, in, you can keep in one tiny museum in Amsterdam. Yeah. So, so I'm not saying that that was the only reason, but the fact that, 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 that Van Gogh was like so out of balance was like really unhealthy. So how do we stay in balance? Well, there are six different areas of life that you want to pay attention to. And if you're not paying attention to one of them, then, then you're out of balance. And if you're only, if you're only pay, paying attention to one or two of them, you're like way out of balance. So the first one is, is spiritual. And, and um, you know, for some of you, that has to do with being Catholic. And for others, it, it has nothing to do with an organized religion. Some people like to, they, they get their spiritual nourishment from, <laughs> excuse me, from nature or from their friends and family. You know, so there's a lot of different ways you can be cool. But it is something you have to pay attention to. It is something you, you have to pay attention to is your spiritual life. Then intellectual, cultural, that's like, um, that, that's not schoolwork. That's like, you know, being interested in things that are, that are um, you know, like reading, uh, you know, fiction, nonfiction, uh, going to the opera, going to the symphony, um, playing an instrument, whatever, you know. But, but again, it's an area of your life that you want to give some attention to and, and, and um, not ignore. Uh, physical, recreational. Um, I, I think we all agree that, like, being a couch potato is not very healthy. You know, just sitting there watching TV all day, all day long or, you know, um, not such a good idea. So, you know, doing things like exercise or playing a sport, um, good things to do to help keep your life in balance. So I like to exercise. I exercise every morning. Well, not every morning, like five out of seven. You know, I, I, I spend some time exercising. And then and I, and I, I play softball on Thursday nights. So that's kind of my thing. I love playing softball. Softball is awesome. Um, financial. So this is an area that is probably beginning to become more important to you. Some of you are probably doing more towards your own support than others, right? But I mean, you know, uh, as you get older, that's, that's going to be your responsibility is taking care of your finances. And, and it's pretty clear that you need to, to pay attention to that because if you don't, you're going to end up in a big hole. And especially for the seniors, this is becoming a pretty important deal because you've got to start thinking college student loans. And that's a, that's a, that's a huge, a huge deal that you have to give a lot of thought to. So clearly an area that you need to pay attention to social. I don't know. Well, I mean, some people have more trouble with it than others, you know, but that's like, you know, making sure that you have friends and, and family that you have interactions with people and not just a loner. Although, you know, different people have different requirements on that. Some people are introverted, some people are extroverted and that's, that's a, but yet you got to be conscious in your, in your balance on that. And then uh, academic career or professional, that's kind of like, um, you know, where you're going in your career, where you're going in your fashion. And, and, and I would think, I would think that most of you really uh, have no clue, which is good, right? Or some, some of you might have like an idea of what you want to be, but, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that your four years of college will probably give you a little bit more direction. And even after that, you might not have a particularly strong path. And, and then even after that, I mean, like I've had, I've had at least distinct careers in my life, you know, so I mean, it's very different. So they, so you can change things, right? But, but having goals and an understanding of yourself in all of these areas is really important. And you might not think, well, what does that have to do with time management? Well, that has a lot to do with time management because what are we, we're managing our time to be able to control events. And this is, these are the things that we want to be able to control. Questions? So far, so, okay, right. Well, I do have actually, um, let me actually just pass this out right now. Um, this is a, like a sheet that I put together. Well, you know what, Let, let's wait. Let's wait on that. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sheet that you can use to help define goals. So let's talk about concentration of power. Probably the one of the three that could have the largest immediate impact on your life. So uh, how many people multitask? Yeah, you're kidding yourself. 
there is no such thing as multitasking. Okay. Multitasking is really what I call serial single tasking, and serial not in the sense of like special K or you know cornflakes, but serial S E R I A L, like you know one thing after another, like serial murderers. You know they kill people one after another, right? But but um, the way the human brain is set up is is we can do one thing at a time. So when you think you're multitasking, really what you're doing is you're doing one thing and then switching to another thing and then switching to another thing and then maybe back to the first thing and then off to another thing. But you're just doing it very quickly. And, and I mean, studies have shown this. that Every time you switch from one focus to another, that takes up some time. It takes some time to kind of regroup yourself. And... Um, you know, even if it's only milliseconds, but sometimes it's longer than that. If you figure how many times a day you're doing that, you are losing a lot of time. You are losing a lot of time by switching from one thing to the other. And so if you really want to manage your time properly, you will use concentration of power. You will have one thing that you're working on, and you will focus on that one thing, and you will get it done, put it away, and then move to the next thing. And I'm telling you, if you if you cultivate this habit, you will free up a lot of time. I might have one student a couple of years ago, well, several years ago, who uh, who did this and said that she freed up like two hours a day. And that's a lot of time, two hours a day. I, I, I'm sure you could think of something you'd like to do for two hours a day, like maybe get some extra sleep, you know, watch a movie or something interesting, right? So... So this is like super important. And, um, you know, like my desk right now, that is, that to me is a very messy desk. You know, I don't, yeah, yeah, right. It doesn't look like it, but it is, that, that's very messy. Because I, I like to have like one thing on my desk and concentrate on that thing and get it done and then put it away where I can't see it so it's not distracting me. And that's what I would encourage you to try, you know, and, and, and if you can develop that into a habit. So, um that's what concentration of power is about. Um, and then there's a relationship between urgent and vital. And it's an interesting uh, relationship. So something that's urgent is something that is screaming for attention, like a ringing telephone, right? Ringing telephone, screaming for attention. But then you pick it up and it's like, you know, somebody wants to talk about your auto warranty or something, right? You know, and so a complete waste of time, right? But it's very urgent. Vital are things that are life-sustaining, but they might not have any urgency. Like, like my the example I like to use is is um, uh, I, I think calling my mom is very important to me. That is a vital thing for me, right? But there is no urgency to it, right? So I have to find a way to make it urgent, and so that I actually so that I actually do it. So we're going to have a little game right here, kind of a game. So some things are urgent and some things are not urgent and some things are vital and some things are not vital. So give me some things that might fit in a box. Give me, give me a thing that might fit in a box. One of these. Things. Yeah. Kira. Your health, your health could be a, a vital and urgent. That is true. Although I think I say that I think your health, H E A L T H could be vital and also not urgent, right? Like exercise, I mean, it's a lot of people don't like to exercise. There's no urgency to it, right? Until they're dead, right? You know, from you know, poor health, right? So, but, but I think, you know, that can go either way. Yeah, good. Other, other box. Yes, Noel. So homework, you're, you're saying be urgent and vital, or you're saying it could also be urgent and not vital, depending upon the homework. Yeah, so I'm, I'm telling you, I think most homework goes right here. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, I think, I think most homework goes there, yeah. I think we should do away with homework entirely, you know. A lot of countries don't have homework, you know. But... Um, uh, but yeah, but it has a tremendous amount of urgency, right? You know, because it's happening, it's got, it's due tomorrow, right? And and uh, and um, yeah, so that's a good one. Homework is a good one. Yes, please. 
vital and not urgent family time yeah i i i and that's that's um that's really true family time right it, it, the only time it becomes urgent is when your mother starts hassling you well you know you guys still live at home most of you i think right so so you know but like when you when you move out you know and your mother's like saying well why aren't you calling me like why aren't you calling me you know and it, then it becomes that, that increases the urgency you know but uh, but generally speaking I, th I think that's true and you know something else that's also true a lot about um uh relationships you know once you get into a like a long-term relationship with somebody um sometimes you forget to, to to invest the time and energy into it you know even and then then it becomes a problem yeah yeah what is something that is not urgent and not vital? Come on, Cadence, what? I, I think that is 100% correct, yeah. Yeah, although I will say sometimes it's an important way to keep in touch with friends. But I would say 90% of the time, it's a it's a complete time suck. Yeah. Socializing and having breaks, like 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 free time and socializing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Especially free time. So free time and socializing. Yeah, no urgency there. Other thoughts? Yeah. Sleep? Yeah. Yeah, when sleep becomes um, urgent is when you fall asleep driving. Does anybody, who drives? Yeah, have you ever fallen asleep driving? Nobody's ever done that yet? Yeah, I've done that before. I'll tell you, one of the most terrifying experiences is when you wake up going 60 miles an hour behind the wheel. It's really, it's really scary. It's, it's, it, yeah. And you, you tend to do that when you're younger and think you're invincible. But, uh, but now when I start getting tired uh, when I'm driving, I just pull off and take a nap. You know, I really I do 20 minutes and I'm and then I'm back in the road. You know, but, but uh, I, and I, don't, I mean, I'd even just pull off into the shoulder if I had to, because I'm not going to drive when I'm going to fall. It's really terrible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's sleep. Yeah, I mean, other than and yeah, yep, that's right. Just pull over. Right. What else we got here? Anything else? But want to add? You kind of get in the picture here. So, with a good time management system, which is what we're going to talk about, what you want to do is really you want to get rid of not vital things. Or you want to minimize not vital things. You want to minimize them. Oh, you're, you're, oh I thought you were clapping getting rid of social media. No, 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 not that. Heaven forbid. Yeah, right. All right. All right. But the, the really important thing that we want to do is we want to take these things that are urgent, not urgent, but vital, and we want to find a way to give them the urgency so that you actually accomplish them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's kind of a lot of what we're doing. This um, has anybody uh, ever heard of President Eisenhower? President Eisenhower. Yeah. So he he was actually the president when I was born. Actually, I take that back. Truman was the president when I was born, um, but Eisenhower was the one that I grew up with. This is sometimes called an Eisenhower Square because he used to do this like on a daily basis, kind of a thing. So a bit of trivia there. All right. I don't know. Is this the most important slide? Might be. I'm not sure. This is the way we determine what you should, what we should do on a daily basis. So at the very base is this thing that says unifying principles, and that's kind of like your personal philosophy. What you're going to, you know, what do you really believe in? What is right? What is wrong? What do you want to do? What do you not want to do? And, and that is something that I, that you will develop if you decide to develop it, you know, probably, you know, like as you're in college and maybe two years after that. Um, 
it's it, it, you know right now you might have some unifying principles especially if you if you if you belong to an organized religion and you and you you know follow the the precepts that is a real solid foundation um but you, you know there 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 are methods to kind of like develop this philosophy and steps that you can do to do it but the more important thing here to me right now is the relationship between long term goals and what you do on a daily basis. Because I used to go to these seminars and the, and the people would say, oh, well, a long-term goal is anything greater than five years away. Or a, uh, a, an intermediate goal is between two and five years. Or an immediate goal is something that you would do if you knew you were going to die tomorrow. And none of that made any sense to me. But when I was listening to the tapes, um, this guy um, really made the relationship clear. And a, a long-term goal, this is important, a long-term goal is a goal in, in one of those six areas that is as far away as you can imagine it. So, um, we have anybody in here who wants to be a doctor? Ah, we got, we got about three doctors. They had none in the last period with, with twice as many students. None. I got three doctors. Okay, so, you want to be a doctor, your long-term goal is um, – probably about uh, 12 years away, right? You got, you, you're thinking I got to do four years of college and then I got to do four years of med school and I got to do four years of residency and, and then I can be a doctor, right? All right. Um, uh, who wants to be something other than a doctor? What? You want to write? Okay, be an author. So, so that is not a 12 year old. Right, it's it's a it's a shorter term goal. At least I hope it's a shorter term goal. Right, it's a short it's a, it's a, it's a shorter term goal. Right, but those are both long term goals in the area of like what your career is going to be. So it has nothing to do with the amount of time that's far away. It has everything to do with your thinking about it and how far away. Because what you do with a long term goal, you break it into little tiny steps. So, for our doctors, right? Well, the first step is, you, you, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of different steps. So one step is I, I, I want to get into a college, right? And then I graduate with a decent grade point average so that I can go to medical school. And then I need to decide what kind of specialty I'm going to have, right? So, there's a lot of intermediate steps in that process. And each of those steps can then be broken down into smaller steps. Am I making sense here? This is, this is like this is what's going to help you accomplish things. Because you want to break them down into steps that are so tiny that you can like accomplish them in like, you know, like a day or even like 10 minutes. And I'll give you an example in, in a minute. Those are the things that you put on your daily to-do list. And you do these little tiny things that are getting you towards your goal. And, and if you keep checking them off, well, guess what happens? You reach your goal. Right? So I, I have this banner up there, which um, was, uh, there are no unreal, unrealistic goals, only unrealistic time frames. And I, I, I really believe that is true, is that you can have like really big goals. Um, and if you break them down into small enough pieces and really try and accomplish each little piece, you will then wind up with, with a, a, a being successful. Now, you might not be as successful as soon as you want, but, but you can get there. So I'll, I'll give you an example here. This is from my own life. Oh, no, this is a form I'm going to give, but I'm going to give you the example from my own life, then I'll give you the form. So um, I was a, 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 a personal financial planner for 25 years before I became a teacher. And um, around 2008, 2009, I decided I'd had enough of that, you know, I, 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 and for a variety of reasons, mainly the Big financial crisis it was really very taxing. Let's put it that way. Um, and so I decided I was going to get out of business. I was going to become a, a math teacher. And so um, I, I kind of broke that down into three intermediate goals. There was an, other ones too, but but three intermediate goals that I broke that down into. One was, well, do I really want to do that? You know, and, and I had to really address the question whether or not I wanted to, to be a math teacher. So I um the, the 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 first step of that for me was to go uh, talk to a career counselor. That's a that's a 
a profession to be a career counselor, just like a you know high school counselor, career counselor. They they counsel people on careers that they might want to take, and and they 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 give you tests and they you know talk to you and then they they kind of help you decide whether that's something that you might really want that you might really like. So um, I did that. But I mean, just to do that as an intermediate step, I had to do several things. I had to, first, I had to find a career counselor that I wanted to go to. So I had to get some referrals. And then I had to call her up and make an appointment. And then I had to show for the appointment. And then I had to take the tests. And then I had to analyze it with her. So there were a lot of little tiny steps there that, that got me through the intermediate step towards, do I really want to be a math teacher? You, you following me here? Right. Then another one was I, I asked my friends. So I have, a, I have several friends who are teachers, and I, I said, hey, do you think that I'd, be a, I'd like being a math teacher? And, but I wanted to get their opinion because they know me. And, you know, sometimes you don't really know yourself as well as other people know you. So um, they all said, oh, yeah, you'd be a great math teacher. Right? And then I asked my wife and kids because I thought they, they know me even better than my friends. Well, in some ways. right? And, um, and they also said they thought it would be a good idea, except my son. My son says, Dad, the problems you're having with your current job, you're just going to bring them over to whatever job you have because they're your problems. They're not the job's problems, right? And, um, and I, thought, I thought, wow, I better think this through more, right? And, he, and I thought about it more, and I said, nah, I think he's wrong. And he was wrong. But, um, but I was really glad that he said that because everybody else are trying to be encouraging and say, yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do this. Right. But he was like, oh, no, 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 dad, this is the wrong thing for you. But, uh, but he was wrong and, and uh, everybody else was right. So I got that intermediate step out of the way. Then I, then I said, well, can I afford to be a teacher? So, you know, uh, uh, Catholic school teachers, they don't make very much money. You know, it's, it's, public school teachers don't make enough money. You know, I mean, that's why, that's why there's this huge, um, what? Yeah, there's a lack of teachers. I mean, it's terrible what's going on in the in the country right now. You know, I mean, they're they're trying to get anybody to be teachers. This is very disturbing. Um, so I was in the financial planning business. I had a lot of financial planners as friends, and I and I got three of them uh, to to kind of talk to me and help me figure out whether or not this is something that I could afford to do. And um, and so, but but to get to that point, I had to think, who who am I going to talk to? I had to gather up all the information that they needed to be able to do the analysis, and um, and then then talk to them, and they all said yes, I could do that, right? So again, uh, little tiny steps to be able to accomplish the intermediate. And then I said, how do I get a job? Now I had already decided that I wasn't going to teach in public school because I didn't want the classroom management problems, um, and and uh, but I didn't know where I wanted to teach. So I had to go find a list um, or different lists, right? And, and, uh, and I will tell you, there are 132 um, private um, high school and middle schools from the West Valley to Arcadia and the North Valley down to Long Beach. Because I found them all and I wrote, I sent them all resumes and letters of inquiry. And then I followed up every single one of those phone calls. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, so just so that I could get some interviews. And so, you know, again, took a very big task, broke it up into tiny little pieces, and, um, and here I am. You know, it, it, it worked, you know. Um, but so, so the long-term goal was to be a high school math teacher. But you can see, break it down into little tinier steps. All I had to do was kind of do each little step, check them off, and then... Here I am. Make sense? Very important, this relationship between, between um, long-term goals and what you do on a daily basis. Um, OK. All right. OK, so let's just talk about uh, planning a little bit. So I'll pass these out. So here is that. I'll just give everybody one here. Oops, sorry. There you go. Here you are. There you go. That's for you. That's for you. And 
this is for you. All right. So what this is is a, um, a a a sheet that I put together that can help you think about goals. So I put each of three the six areas up at the top, and each of the areas has a spot where you can write a long-term goal as far away as you're thinking um, for that area. And then you can kind of, you know, pencil in some steps, some intermediate steps. And, it, it, you know, you don't have to have three for every single one, you know, but, but if you kind of spend some time thinking about this, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. When you, when you like, think about a goal, um, you know, there, the, I don't believe that it, like, magically happens. But when you think about a goal, what it does is it, is it puts it into your head, into your subconscious. And then when you're experiencing the world, you tend to notice opportunities that will lead you towards that, right? So again, it's not like this magic, oh, I can think about it and I can wish it and make it true, but, but just having it in your consciousness um, makes it so that you see different opportunities that pop up and then you can move in, the, in, that, in that direction. This is a nice thing to do. Um, uh, what I would do, um, I haven't done this in a couple of years, but, but really uh, for a long part of my life, every year I would take like between Christmas and uh, New Year's, you know, that, that, that kind of everything's kind of chilling out and it's a time for reflection. And I, w I, would take a, um, I would take a day, at least half a day, and, and take a little notebook and, and go out to a park and uh, be by myself. And kind of think through, well, what are some of the things that I would like to do? And I would bring my last year's goals. I'm not always changing goals every year. But sometimes new things would pop up, and old things wait away. They become less important. And uh, it's a really great exercise to this. And then, because I have, like, I have my goals. Um, I just keep them in the very front of my planner here, right there. And so, ever have a planner? Yes. So, how many people have a paper planner? And how many people have an electronic planner? Uh, okay. Well, you need a planner. And if you don't have one, I'll help you find one. That 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 would work. I like paper because, um, like my planner here, one of the things I really like about it is um, I get these pages that have a whole month. You know, so I can look at the whole month and and see what's going on. Whereas on the electronic ones, I've never found a good electronic one. You know, they have little dots when things are happening. You've got to push a dot, and then, then that one thing comes up, and then you can't see the other things. And, and So having it in paper to me is really I, – I can really sense what's going on for this month, right? But what I do is um, literally every day I'll spend like 10 or 15 minutes in the beginning of the day, and I'll, I'll, I'll make my to-do list. And I make my to-do list referring to my, my goals. Now, not everything on my to-do list has to do with my goals. I mean, like going to and getting milk is not, you know, a long-term goal, right? But, but I have to go on my to-do list because otherwise I'll forget to do it. Like today I'm supposed to do something. Oh, I'm supposed to get cottage cheese for my wife. That's right. But, uh, you know, um, but so I, I, I make a to-do list every day, and, and I want some of those little tiny steps towards getting an intermediate goal done on my to-do list because then I'll be able to, 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 to check it off and move a little bit, little bit closer. But I do this every day, and I don't just carry over the same to-do list. I rewrite it every day because some days the thing that was important yesterday isn't so important today, and I don't need to do that anymore. Right? And lots of times I'll, I'll, I'll read things on my to-do list, um, and after like a week or two I realize, you know, that really wasn't so important anyways, I, I, and I just forget it, right? After you make your list of things to do, the, the, the important thing is to prioritize it. What's your number one? What's your number two? And you do this quietly by yourself so that you're moving this urgency kind of thing. You're doing it because these are the things that I want to accomplish. Like, like, like getting cottage cheese for my wife, I don't know, that's not so high on my list, you know. You know, other things are like, like, like today, uh, my, my, what was my number one job today? Oh, yeah, it was to send some emails to some students that had missed class to kind of help them keep up. That was my number one thing to do. Um, and then I had, oh, seniors, who's seniors, right? 
and um, you got the volleyball uh, email, right, about the end Notre Dame Day. Yeah, yeah. So I had to do that because that was kind of urgent and vital, right? So things like that, you know, and I, but I prioritize them. And the thing about prioritizing them is that I can have concentration of power because then I can look at my list and I say, I decided this this morning when, when there was no pressure or no phones ringing or anything like that, I decided this was my number one job. I get rid of everything else, and I do my number one job. And then I finish that, and then I do my number two job. And then I finish that, and I, and I feed that way. And, and so really, I, I didn't have a free – I had a free period the first period of the day, and I was halfway through my to-do list by the end of the first period. Whereas if I didn't have the list and I didn't prioritize it, um, I would have been like, I don't know, like cleaning the boards or, you know, reading the New York Times or some, you know, something that might be okay, but not really all that important. As it is, then I, I got done some pretty important things. So prioritizing it is like, is like super essential. Am I doing okay? Do uh, we have any questions so far? Okay. So what we're going to do is, you know, after we do the weekly plan on the first day of the week, I'm going to be eight or ten minutes to do some personal planning. And what I'm trying to do is, is get you in the habit of, of doing some personal planning. Now, when I do it, I'm going to say, oh, why don't you work on your long-term goals, or why don't you work on your 25-year plan, or something like that. And I know that most of you are going to be using that time to, what, what tests do I have coming up tomorrow, or, you know, you know more immediate things, right? But, but, but I want you to try and get in the habit of trying to think about these things, and, and, and do some planning. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. And um, it surprises me because uh, uh, a, a lot of the students really uh, like, well, I think everybody likes it, but um, a lot of them find it like really essential to kind of have a little bit of time where they can plan. All right. So are we good with this still? All right, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. So, Notice the sign over here. I'm sure you've noticed it many times because I stand here, so it's right behind me, so you have to look at it. Yeah, so um, I have a little card for everybody with the five habits. There you go. There you go. Here you are. Here you are. There you go. Now, if you if you happen to lose it or you want another one, I I keep them right over here to the uh, the hand sanitizer, and uh, you're welcome anytime you want one, right? But I I mean I have I I, I, I talk to students you know from 10 years ago that that have, still have this in their wallet, and they refer to it a lot. And the reason that I I give this out and that I talk about it is because. If you do these five things, and I'm not kidding you here, if you do just these five things, you are in the top 90, you're in the top 5% of everybody in this country. And it's hard to believe, but, you know, I, 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 I've seen this from experience. So I'm just going to go through them one at a time here. Happen number one, show up on time, right? So if you have a meeting with somebody, and you're late, what, are you, what is the message you're sending? Yeah, please. The louder that you really don't want? Yeah, that you really don't want to be there. They're really not that important. You're important. They're not that important because I'm like, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I said that is not a really very good way to start off a relationship is by telling somebody, I don't care. I really don't want to be here. No. That, 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 so, so showing up on time is really a big deal. It's really a big deal. And, 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 and calling somebody on your cell phone and saying I'm stuck in traffic is not an excuse, right? Because we've all lived in L.A. from time. We know there's traffic, right? So how do you avoid being late when you know there's traffic?
That's uh, that's right. We're gonna say something. Leave early. Yeah. yeah. Right. And show up. So when I was in business, I would go to these appointments, and I would I would frequently show up early. And so what I would do is I would go into the receptionist and I'd say I have an appointment with Mr. and Mrs. So and So. Um, I'm 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 a half hour early. Um, but if they'd like to meet with me, um, I'd be happy to meet with them now. You know, or I can wait. Whatever it's whatever is easiest for them. Most of the time they'd say, "Well, oh, come on and meet right now." And so I'd get that meeting over, then I'd go to the next one. I'd be like way early, right? And I'd do the same thing. And there were lots of days when I would like, you know, finish my day like two, three hours early because I was just kind of on time for my meetings or a little, little bit early. So showing up on time is a big deal. It's a big deal. So, so take it seriously. Numbers two and three are very similar. Do what you say you're going to do. Let's talk about that. Do what you say you're going to do. Um, how many of you have been to a retail store where uh, – let me finish the story here. <laughs> I, I would hope you've been to a retail store, you know, at least once or twice, right, where the, you're talking with a salesperson, and they say, oh, let me go check in the back, and then you never see them again. Have you ever had that happen? Yes. Or how about if, if you're on the phone, like, you know, and they say, oh, I, I'm going to find out from so-and-so what's going on, and they put you on hold. You know, and then you got to listen to a little jingle for 15 minutes before you figure out that they're never coming back, right? Yeah. Don't do that. If you say you're going to do something, like, do it. You know, I mean, if you can't, if something really physically comes up that, that, that prevents you from doing it, that's one thing, right? But don't be a flake, right? And there's, a, there's, 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 there's an abundance of flakes um, in the business world and in, in this country, you know, in every country, right? So you're distinguishing yourself. You say you're going to do something, and then you actually accomplish it. Uh, finish what you start. I, I'd say that the, the, those two are really very similar, right? If you start something, like carry it through to the end. You know, I mean, again, sometimes there's there's situations that happen, and you and you can't finish it. You know, but but for the most part, um, if you say you're going to do something and you start it, like finish it. So. One, two, three, and five, I, uh, I, I borrowed from somebody. Didn't plagiarize. It's public domain, right? But, but, but number I made up. And, and it's one that everybody remembers. Under promise, over deliver. So um, a client asks me for something, a report. And I think, I'm thinking to myself, I, I can get that done by Friday. And I say to the client, I'll have it for you by next Tuesday. Right? And then I deliver it on Friday. And what do you think the client thinks? They, they think I'm like walking on water, right? Because, because I said it was going to be, I'm, I'm early with this thing, right? So, so build yourself into, build, your, build in some uh, 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 wiggle time to do stuff and, and then deliver early. It makes, it makes a big difference. And, um, and it's not lying, you know, you're maybe a little white lie of sorts, you know, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, lying, but it, it is, it is super helpful. And I would use this with teachers. I would use this with, with anybody, you know, if you're going to make a promise to do something, give yourself some extra time because, there's almost never a time when something is like so urgent that it has to be like right now, right? But, they, but people want to know when it's going to happen. And it says communicate. So one of the things I did in business was um, anytime I had a job that I was doing for a client, I would, um, I would have my staff or me contact, contact them every single week just to let them know that I was speaking on it. You know, some things took, but would like take a, you know, several weeks or a month. And I, every week I wanted them to know that I was working on it. And really sometimes it would just be an email. Haven't forgotten about you. We're still going to get it done by, you know, next week or next month or whatever it is, right? And that's really important because if you're not hearing somebody, you think they've forgotten you. You know, I mean, I, I know that I feel that way all the time. You know, if I haven't heard from somebody for about a week, if they're working on something for me, I'm kind of wondering, well, did they forget? You know, do I have to remind them? So if you reach out and communicate, that's going to make a big difference. And the, the last thing to say, please and thank you, 
And, um, you know, all of these, and this one too, you know, this is things we learned in elementary school. You know, please and thank you. You know, uh, there, there, there's, um, you know, how that, as you as students, but like a lot of times when you're leaving class, you know, thank you, Mr. Jank, if they may, right? You know, you know, the teachers really appreciate that. I mean, that, that it, it doesn't seem like much, but I tell other friends of mine that teach and I say, oh yeah, when the kids leave class, they say, thank you. And they look at me like, Are, really? Are they do that? You know? So, um, these five things, you are in the top five. It doesn't even matter if you're skilled at what you do, but just these five things and you're really in the top 5%. Are we good? Still good? Okay. All right. Let's, let's, let's move along here. So this, this is a time log. And uh, you know what? I have one that is um, designed for you guys. Let me get it up here. Let me see here. Uh, NDA, uh, everyone folder. It's in the everyone folder. It's time log right there. Okay. So you'll notice that this has diff categories, and these are the categories that I found that, that you as students um, uh, spend your time for the most part. There's being in class, which takes a lot of your time. There's schoolwork. There's extracurriculars, spending time with family and friends, social media, uh, passive screen time, like watching TVs or movies, um, self-care, exercise, and then, there's, and then there's other things. Right. So the way this works, uh, let me get an example here. Let me get a, a better example. I should have had this better organized here, but uh, let's see, NDA, miscellaneous, time management, time log. Okay, so um, this is not one that's designed for, uh, for, for school, but this person, when they're in their time log, they have planning, meetings, interruptions, telephone, reading, preoccupation, correspondence. You with me here? All right. So the way this works is wake up at 8 o'clock. And the first entry in your time log is at 8.30. So you spend 30 minutes. And you have to account for those 30 minutes. So this person did uh, 8 minutes making his uh, to-do list. Uh, nine minutes, eight minutes, I can't remember. Looks like nine. Nine minutes, uh, somebody uh, interrupted him. Uh, Thirteen minutes on a, a sales call, and that's what he did. Right. I think there might be something else over here. But the minutes have to add up to the 30 minutes. Are you, are you following me here still? Okay. Um, and then each thing you you list you categorize it as either an A, B, C, or a D. An A is vital, a B is important, a C is kind of eh, and a D is a complete waste of time. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. See, so so somebody dropped in to complain about a job, and, he, and he's saying that was a D. It's a waste of time, right? Right. And, and that is a waste of time when you know, in the business world, right? So. Um, if we if we kind of go back to our time logger, right? Um, when I first did this, I I was like shocked because I found that I was spending like seventy to eighty percent of my time on C's and D's. And then I made some changes in what I did, and uh, and I switched it around so I was spending most of my time on A's and B's. So here is my um, offer. Listen carefully. My offer is that if you do a time log and keep it up for two weeks, that's every day, each one of these is a day, every day for two weeks, um, uh, end of the semester, I, I bump your grade up uh, like a, a step, like B to B plus, B plus to A minus, whatever it is, you know. This is in addition to the mastery thing that we do, right? This is, if you do the time log thing, um, then, uh, then I'll, I'll give you that great bump up. Uh, you know, it's not a requirement. You know, it's totally voluntary. Uh, I usually get a handful of students that do it every, uh, every semester. And um, they generally get a lot out of it. Because what happens is, um, 
we do a couple days worth. I show you how to do it on uh, on Excel. I have this set up in in Excel so that you can um, do it as an in, in an Excel spreadsheet. And then at the end of the uh, of the two weeks, I get all these great um, reports, like you know how much A, B, C, and D time you've done, um, what are the different categories that you spent time in, you know, and um, and people find it really pretty interesting and pretty useful. So um, I have time log sheets down here, if you, you know, and what you do is you um, you do it on paper and then into the Excel sheet after I show you that. So if you decide to do this, which again is not mandatory at all, but it's something that you might find interesting, um, do it on paper for a couple of days, only a couple of days, and then come see me so that we can make sure you're doing it right, and then we can put it into the Excel. Because I have had students that, that did it for like a week and, and, and it was all wrong and then they had to redo it and it was not, not so great. So that's the time log deal. Um, we already did the college level stuff. So that's it. Yes, please. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Consecutive. They should be consecutive. And they, they should not cover vacation time. And they shouldn't cover like final exam week or AP or anything like that. So like you're trying to find two like relatively normal weeks. You know, there's there's no such thing as a normal week. You know, I mean, they, you know, you'll have a three day weekend. That's fine. You know, and it, and it and it has to be done on the weekends too, because the weekends is where you have a lot of discretionary time, and and that's where you you know we want to you want to see how you're spending it. Yeah. But it's a it's a it's a it's a cool exercise. Uh, and I, uh, Haley Smith did it last year. You know, Haley, right? So you can ask her about it. Um, a couple other people did it that graduated. Yeah. Questions. None. Okay, was that all right? Helpful? I hope so. So, all right, so now we're going to stop recording.